My name is Tom Isaacs. I've had Parkinson's for 22 years. I was diagnosed at the age of 26, but as many of you know, if we all lived long enough, we would all get Parkinson's. So the way I look at it is the younger you get Parkinson's, the more likely that the cause is associated with a genetic mutation, and therefore, the further down Darwin's theory of evolution you have evolved. In fact, last year I was in Rome with Roger and Marlin, at a meeting about stem cells whilst vid visiting St. Peter's. And I looked at Michelangelo's painting in the Sistine Chapel, which I think gives us some clues as to how Parkinson's was first created, and perhaps also how it will end. Now, I'm not particularly religious, but I do know that God made man in the image of himself. I also know from my somewhat shallow studies of Bible, the Bible that God it moves in mysterious ways. So. I think he's pretty much on side here. Um, you also only have to look at this close-up of um, a picture of Adam's hand. Uh, and I'm not a neurologist, but note the slightly awkward posture of his hand, suggesting some cogwheel rigidity, perhaps even some dystonia. Perhaps God is trying to cure Adam's Parkinson's. After all, we've already heard this morning about pluripotent stem cells, and there are also such things as multipotent and totipotent stem cells. So why not try some omnipotent stem cells? <laughs> so while in Rome, my wife and I went in search of someone who could provide us with these omnipotent stem cells, <laughs> and we found a dealer in the Vatican. And you know what? I did feel better after meeting him. I apologise for the gratuitous nature of this slide, but there are not many opportunities I get to share this photo to so many people at the same time. And I'm in, and I'm in need of an ego boost today, so... <laughs> um, but today, we're not so much focusing on divine intervention. Today, we're concentrating on Renaissance medicine. Because rightly or wrongly, many people living with Parkinson's believe that stem cell therapy has the potential to quite literally restore us to, to our previous selves so that we can say we used to have Parkinson's, our very own renaissance. So are these perceptions wrong? Are we kidding ourselves that someday soon we might actually succeed in rolling out stem cell therapy on a wide scale to, put to people with long-term neurological chronic condi conditions? Of course, no one can really answer this question because as you've already heard, at the moment, the field of cell therapy is, is at a critical point in its development. A kind of stem cell wars, in which stem cells can come from either a dodgy source, usually combined with far-fetched and false claims about their efficacy, or they come from a reliable source, like those being studied by the previous speakers here today. So we need to stand by these scientists, who hopefully in the long run will, will, offer, will be able to offer us a source of stem cells and therapies which are evidence-based. <laughs> those Steve Fink binaries in there as, as Han Solo, I actually think there's a striking, reminiscent, striking resemblance to George Lucas. No matter the rest of you. Um, um, and we as patients must not, not be taped, tempted at all by, the, by all the bogus medicine and stem cells sourced from the dark side. The dark side of the source, if you like. Ooh. Um. But of course, there's one Jedi Knight we're missing from this um, group. Obi run Denobi. <laughs> Took me hours to do that in Photoshop. But my role today is to give the patients perspectives in terms of how we perceive stem cell therapy, how much we know about regenerative, regenerative medicine, how it is communicated to us, and the different ways that we respond to what we are told. Chuck these on the floor. Um, and finally, how we can filter out the hope from the hype. 
and ensure that we do not damage this field of medicine by engaging with this type of therapy prematurely and getting involved with treatments which are advertised and promoted but which also have no clinical proof of eff efficacy and have not been validated by the essential robust evidence-based medicine in which the three previous speakers are involved. So what comes into the head of someone with Parkinson's when the word when the words stem cell therapy are mentioned. Here are a few examples which spring to mind. And on what are patients' views about stem cell therapy founded? Again, I've listed a few of the confl conflicting perspectives that patients have. Hope, desperation, other patients' experiences. Sensationalized media reports, false claims from pri private clinics, over cautious approach by, by scientists, regulators, and clinicians, ethical issues, judicial proceedings, due to stamina case in, in Italy, successful evidence based treatments. Conflicting reports on timescales from immediate to 25 years. It's no wonder we're all so confused. <laughs> so how can patients be guided through their neurological journey so that they have access to the right information, robust information, at the right time? This is the critical question. If we are to avoid the health tourism and the likes, of therapies such as stamina being authorised as it was in Italy and the Australian uh, stem cell trial which Roger was talking about earlier. So we desperately need better communication about the facts, the truth about, truth about stem cells. How do we know which doctors are which doctors? I don't know whether you can read that. It's okay, I'm actually just a flamboyantly costumed osteopath. <laughs> How do we distinguish between click? Snake oil from shake oil. I did some market research on the availability of the so-called stem, stem cell treatments for Parkinson's by searching for them on Google. Within the first three pages, there were nine offerings from private clinics, all, from private clinics, all of them offering the earth. These clinics are generally instantly recognizable because on the front page, on the front page of their websites, they have a couple of ridiculously attractive soft, soft focus models with spray on gray hair getting to be septuagenarians having the time of their lives because they're so in love. Here is an example on this slide. Now I know quite a few reputable pharmaceutical companies who also use this approach, but not to quite the extent that these private clinics do. So whoever you are out there displaying these pictures of old people who are literally leaping for joy because they're taking your product, please stop it. We as, we as patients are not fooled by your forever young sales pitch. I digress. So, patients need to be better informed. We need to be able to distinguish between different types of therapy. To have a basic understanding of what stem cell therapy actually is, how it compares to other possible symptomatic treatments and other forms of regenerative medicine, such as growth factors or gene therapy. As patients, we need to understand not just about our own personal situation, but to have a sense of how this fits within the overall scientific community and the overall progress in Parkinson's. With greater consensus and consistency of information about the wider issues, maybe there would be no place for these cl private clinics offering dubious, dubious and unproven interventions. But for many patients, reading the testimonies of other patients, as well as the apparently robust 
clinical data on the websites of these private clinics are quite alluring. And without access to specialist knowledge, it can be compelling enough to entice them to part with large sums of money. Furthermore, most of the current credible and evidence-based cell therapy studies seem to be riddled with delays, red tape, and trial design issues. But studies such as Professor Roger Barker's Transura are actually proceeding and offer an enormous hope for those of us with Parkinson's. But understandably, communication of this trial needs to be considered and precise, even if the results prove to be very good. Because there is not really any news out there at the moment which can communicate, there is, which can be communicated, there is a tendency for the medical community to, to, to veer towards a rather paternalistic and conservative perspective when confronted by patients. But this is where the extremes of opinion involved with cell therapy needs to, be, needs to be tackled. On the one hand, it is being sensationalized by the media or by commercially orientated private clinics. On the other, it is associated with slow progress, delayed trials, unpleasant side effects, indecisive regulation, indecisive regulation and general pessimism. The best way to get the right message through with clarity and common sense is to engage with patient advocates so that they can communicate peer to peer, from patient to patient. This is absolutely critical and there's an area which needs to be properly resourced and utilised as this type of therapy gets closer to the clinic. Finally, of course, it is absolutely critical that any patient considering stem cell therapy of any kind, at any stage, needs to be sufficiently informed to be able to make a decision about whether, as to whether this type of treatment is, is right for them at that particular time. There is, of course, the golden rule of communication. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But then, of course, there is the platinum rule. Do unto others as they would have you do unto them. <laughs> there is a small but important difference between these two statements. In other words, communicate in accessible language. And here I thought I would, it would be useful just to emphasize that last point by showing you a few extracts from something I've call, called the Cynical Patient's Dictionary. So politically incorrect definitions of Parkinson's to the general public, the shaky people. Person with Parkinson's, something that I've got for the time being until Roger Barker, Patrick Brennan, or some other genius takes it away. <laughs> to the neuroscientist. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> the patient. The general public. Someone who lies in a bed in a hospital who sneezes a lot. Person with Parkinson's, the thing I'm when I have a hospital appointment and the thing I'm not three hours later when no one has seen me. To the neuroscientist, a live brain with legs. Some even have the power of communication, but this scenario is best avoided. <laughs> Patient engagement. General public, two sneezing people betrothed to be married. Person with Parkinson's, Fancy world in which we have control and influence over our healthcare needs. To a neuroscientist, brain donation upon death. <laughs> Acronyms. The general public, things what fall off an oak tree. <laughs> Person with Parkinson's, any two, one, one syllable, three letter words used by, used by neuroscientists, e.g., pet. STN or PPN, stands for positron emission tomography, subthalamic nucleus or pedunculate pontine nucleus, just to show off there. Um, to a neuroscientist, a necessary encoding and device to prevent normal people from understanding what on earth we're talking about. <laughs> but <laughs> if there's one thing I'd like to stress in this talk, it's is that the success of regenerative medicine cannot be measured in scientific terms alone. 
True value of such treatments is vested solely on the impact they have on people, people's quality of life. And that is going to be far greater if stem cell therapy is combined with a package of carefully planned and personalized treatment plans. If stem cell therapy is to be rolled out as a standard treatment for something like Parkinson's, it must come as, as, as a multidisciplinary approach with defined best practices in which, to which industry, politicians, the judicial system, doctors and patients all need to contribute, agree and adhere. Without this clarity, the potential for mistakes at every, at every stage of the development of stem, cell of stem cell therapy is huge. But since writing this dictionary, communication in medicine has, has taken a significant turn for the better and the medical model has evolved from paternalism to individualism. Information exchange is now the dominant, dominant communication model and the health consumer movement has led to, to the current model of shared decision making. Sorry, sorry, yeah. And the, health consumer, and the health consumer movement has led to the current model of shared decision-making and patient-centered communication. This is all wonderful news, but I think there is another form of communication which is lacking, particularly in relation to Parkinson's. Parkinson's affects every part of a person, mind, body, and soul. But there is one medicine that treats all three better than any other. This is a medicine called hope. Hope ignites a fire in the soul and rekindles the dying embers of ambition and purpose. When people with Parkinson's accept that there is a chance, no matter how small, that we are not doomed to a life born out of our worst nightmares, then we start to gather information about our Parkinson's and we start to concentrate on the things we can do rather than, rather than those we can't. So why are our healthcare advisors so reluctant to prescribe hope? Why aren't they as excited as perhaps they should be about all the progress that is going on around Parkinson's. Why aren't we all filled with hope? Why no hope? The answer is because if you put the why in hope, you get something which is the flip side of hope. And this is, can be extremely damaging both to us as patients, but also to scientists and clinicians. So putting the why in hope, hype. So you see from this how hope, hope can so easily be derived from hype. So what does, distinguish, what does distinguish hype from hope? I think although both words are associated with uncertainty, hope has an integrity and a safety profile attached to it. That uncertainty to that uncertainty. Whereas hype involves risks, a lack of evidence, and is a word which has far more negative connotations. Also, if you expand hope, you reach belief. But if you expand hype, and you might end up being locked up for fraud. All in all, hope is considerably better for our health in the long run than hype. The whole purpose of my own organization, the Cure Parkinson's Trust, is to join the dots from hope to belief to reality. That is our mission, and we are closing in on, on, on this goal. End of advertisement. But as people with Parkinson's, we have all been subjected to hype at some stage during our, our time with the condition. We've all seen countless newspaper articles and websites with headlines which say the cure is nigh and we will all rise again like Lazarus, emerging from the embers of Parkinson's like phoenixes, living happily ever after until the end of time. This media hype is not helpful and typically the response of the medical sector and patient organisations is guarded and conservative. The, st the standard comment which we have all read so many times is it is too early to say whether this treatment will be a breakthrough in Parkinson's and it will be five years until we really understand its potential. <laughs> Bloody five years. Um, 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 as you all know this five years which is cited by the Parkinson's experts across the world is the longest five years that has ever been witnessed since the dawn of time. Somewhere between these two extremes, between the understandable conservatism of our Parkinson's advisors and the far-fetched rant rantings of the tab tabloid press and assorted nutters who infect the internet with their miracle cures, 
there lies a careful balance of hopeful, hopeful optimism, which needs to be struck. Because right now, there is genuine hope for all of us living with Parkinson's. There are a kaleido kaleidoscope of ways which are currently being researched, which offer the prospect of slowing, stopping, and perhaps even reversing this condition. And that's not hype, that's reality. So my point is that by involving patients in both the assessment of risk and in clinical trials and in funding and in the funding of innovative science, a balance of judgment is achieved which reflects the reality and severity of an illness far better. People with Parkinson's must try to accept greater, greater responsibility in all aspects of their condition. So what is the best way forward with stem cell therapy? I would be the first to admit that there are many people in this room more qualified than me to answer this question. That, however, is not going to stop me trying. <laughs> For me, progress with stem cell therapy requires a disease-specific steering group comprising representatives from all stakeholders. At the moment, it feels to me as though the regulators, the scientists, the politicians and the doctors are all working in their own silos and are only really, very rarely showing flexibility or empathy for the different standpoints from which everyone is coming. I also think there should be, should be defined boundaries between science and issues which relate more to judicial precedent and human, human rights. I believe that every patient should have the right to make informed decisions about their health and that these decisions, as long as they are reasonable, should be supported by the medical profession. Obviously, there needs to be sufficiently rigorous guidelines to be put in place here, but the principle should be that doctors should not be liable for the actions of their patients as long as they have not been negligent in the advice that they have given. Scientists have a fundamental role to communicate their aims as well as the limitation of their ongoing studies. The expectation of the use of stem cells as a therapy should be affirmed with caution within the guidelines imposed by the regulators, who in turn should be more open to listen to disease-specific expertise and patient experiences, particularly in the context of risk and benefit. The judges need to take responsibility to agree with the best scientific evidence without imposing their own personal interpretation which could easily be influenced by the social expectations of poor prognosis for patients and their families. The judges should also punish those playing on patient vulnerabilities and selling false claims about a given therapy. As, thank you. As for, the, as for the politicians, well, they must not be swayed by the over-optimistic claims of patients, but should guarantee the constitutional right of every patient to make their own health decisions. Doctors must help patients to better understand the nature and the types of therapy on offer. It's relevance to the individual person, not to the condition, and to ensure that they, never, they are never separated from robust scientific methodology and evidence. And last but not least, we patients need to get involved and engage with all aspects of this emerging and truly exciting technology. There, it's all very simple, really. So I just have one more entry from my uh, cynical patient's dictionary. I've got one minute and five seconds left, so... Drugs. The general public. Things I get over the counter at the chemist, which I take from time, from time to time, which make me feel better. The person with Parkinson's. Things I get on prescription at the chemist, which I take all the time, which generally make me feel worse and all of which had Italian names. <laughs> you know, so many things I nick from the cupboard down the hall, which I take at the weekend, which allow me to attend rave parties well into Sunday. <laughs> and finally, here's my final quote for the day.
Thank you very much. <laughs>